Hey guys, Tristan here from the south of England on quite a cold and frosty morning. Uh, just wanted to give you a little update on the channel just before this uh, video starts. It's on the Bosporan Civil War, you guys are going to love this video. It's got action from the start all the way to the end and it's a really, really bloody civil war. It goes from one person being on top to the other really quickly but I'm not going to give too much away on that. But anyway, quite a quick update on the channel. I've got a lot of content planned in the near future. And I'm not going to give it uh, too much away, but I think you guys are going to absolutely love it. If you've seen uh, the series I did with Kings and Generals on the Wars of the Successors, and if you've also heard of another channel, quite a famous history channel called The Great War. Now, I think how those two could go together, and you might be on the right tracks. But I will reveal more at a later date. Until then, please enjoy today's video on the Bosporan Civil War. Three ten BC, and the king is dead. In his lifetime, he had ruled a mighty empire, and leaves on his deathbed one of the most lucrative kingdoms in the known world. But trouble is stirring. The dead king's three sons all desire this prize, and now prepare to fight it out through blood and battle. Only one will emerge victorious. Early graves await the losers. This is the story of a fratricidal struggle for supremacy unlike any other. In 311 BC, the Bosporan Kingdom was enjoying the height of its power, the jewel of the Black Sea. From its small beginnings as a collection of Greek colonies in the 6th century BC, by 311 BC, the kingdom had risen to become a dominant power on the northern shoreline of the Black Sea. It was famous for its grain exports, and back then was considered the breadbasket of the known world. Yet no kingdom enjoys endless immunity from instability. No golden age can last forever. In 310 BC, the Bosporan king Pyrasades died after a 38-year reign. In his lifetime, Pyrasades had continued in the successful footsteps of his predecessors, and ruled one of the most lucrative kingdoms in the world. By the time of his death, such was this man's renown that many worshipped him as a god. Yet regardless of how great and awe-inspiring a leader he may have been in life, the death of a strong leader often initiates chaos. The kingdoms of Alexander the Great, Lysimachus and Herod to name just a few. The death of Pyrasades was to be no different. Upon his passing, Pyrasades left three sons, Satyrus, Protanus, and Eumelos. As Satyrus was the eldest, Pyrasades had declared him his successor. The Spartacid line was supposed to move on smoothly. Protanus duly accepted his father's appropriate choice, pinning his colours to Satyrus's kingship. Yet Eumelos, the youngest, had other ideas. Not desiring to be in the shadow of either Satyrus or Pritanis, Eumelos had his gaze firmly fixed on ruling the wealthy and powerful Bosporan kingdom, a mighty prize. He had every intention of challenging for it. As Satyrus commenced his new rule, Eumelos went seeking allies to support his own claim. He found them soon enough. To the east of the Bosporan kingdom, in modern-day southern Russia, was the kingdom of the Syracais. Inhabiting the land alongside the Hippanis River, now the Kuban River, the Syracais were a Sarmatian tribe that were no strangers to the Bosporan kingdom. Controlling a huge domain, the Syracais king, Ariphanes, had a powerful army at his back. Eumelos knew this all too well and sought an alliance. Upon receiving Eumelos's plea, Arifani saw his opportunity to gain great influence in the Bosporan Kingdom and agreed to aid him. Mustering a great army of 42,000 men, including 22,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry, Eumelos and Arifani's marched to war. Meanwhile, Satyrus had not been idle. Realising the feud could only be resolved by the sword, he gathered a great army to confront his upstart brother. Fratricidal conflict now appeared inevitable. 
just as Eumelos's army consisted overwhelmingly of Sarmatians. The lion's share of Satyrus's troops were Scythians, both as cavalry and infantry. Various Scythian tribes, such as the Tauri and the Sindhi, were subject to the Bosporan kingdom at this time and were keen to prevent Arifanes and his Sarmatian Syracais gaining control. It was in their interests that Satyrus remain in power. For the Bosporan king, they were a welcome addition. Still, Satyrus's army did not consist entirely of Scythians. Not only did he have a substantial number of hardened Thracian warriors, but he also had 2,000 expert Greek mercenaries trained to fight as hoplites, heavy infantrymen wielding spear and shield. Specialist heavy infantry, light infantry and cavalry, Satyrus had all at his disposal. With this formidable army, numbering some 34,000 men, he set forth to confront young Eumelos. Neither would refuse to fight, and in 310 BC, somewhere along the bank of the river Thatis, the two forces approached each other. Battle was imminent. Having crossed the river, Satyrus surrounded his camp with a defensive wall of wagons and marched his army out for the impending showdown. Satyrus placed himself and his mounted bodyguard, presumably including many Bosporan nobles that had both Thracian and Greek heritage, in the centre of the line, surrounded by a phalanx wall of his infantry. As for his terrifying Scythian cavalry, equipped with either javelins, bows, axes, spears or swords, Satyrus presumably placed these on each wing, along with some of his mercenaries. Still, perhaps this was not all. Fifty years earlier, Satyrus's grandfather, King Lucon I, had devised a ruthless strategy to ensure his hoplites' loyalty remained steadfast during battle. He posted his hoplites in the first line, and in their rear the Scythians, who had express orders that if the hoplites gave way, they should strike them down with their javelins. Although heartless, the strategy worked and Lucon won the day. Thus, as his grandfather had once done, Satyrus may also have placed some Scythian warriors behind his mercenaries, an incentive to ensure his paid professionals did not flee the field. It was a ruthless, if not effective, strategy. Like Satyrus, Arifanes placed himself in the centre of the opposing Syracuse army, being both their king and commander. As for Eumelos, he commanded the cavalry on Arifanes' right wing. Battle commenced with Eumelos charging his force into the mercenaries on the right of Satyrus's line. As this fight was going on, however, Satyrus made his move. Realising that Arifanes has similarly deployed himself in the centre of his line, he gathered his finest cavalry and embarked on a risky but potentially decisive move. With himself in the lead, Satyrus and his men charged the Syracuse king. With spear and shield, the two forces of mounted bodyguards clashed, the fighting fierce on either side. Yet eventually a breakthrough was made. Suffering under the weight of Satyrus's attack, Arifanes and his cavalry crumbled and fled. Satyrus's attack had been decisive, causing the Syracuse chief to rout, though the battle was not yet over. As Satyrus began to pursue the fleeing Arifanes, news reached the Bosporan king that would alter his plans completely. Eumelos and his cavalry were still in the fight, carving a path through his right wing, and what remained of Satyrus's army was now under threat, his own mercenaries having lost their nerve and turned tail. If Satyrus did place any guards behind his mercenaries, evidently it did not work. Realising the perilous situation, the Bosporan king gave up the chase and returned to the battlefield. Arifani survived to fight another day. 
although initially gaining great success. The spirits of Eumelos and his cavalry must have dropped, as they saw hundreds of ferocious horsemen bearing down on them, keen to gain complete victory. The result was devastating. Eumelos's force and what remained of Arifanes' army was routed, yet the young claimant survived. The battle of the River Thatis was over. Satyrus had emerged victorious and won his spurs. Critically, however, neither of his opponents lay dead on the field. He had failed to cut the head off the Hydra. Satyrus may have won the battle, but the war was far from over. Following their setback, Eumelos, Arifanes, and what remained of their army retreated to Syracana, Arifanes' capital, situated on a large island further along the Thatis River, with Satyrus following close on their heels. Upon reaching Syracana, shock and dismay must have struck Satyrus and his pursuing army. Not only was the Thatis River encircling the island very deep, but commanding cliffs and thick woods surrounded Arifanes' stronghold, making Syracana accessible in only two places. Arifanes knew this all too well. His men had sighted outworks and several dominating wooden towers to protect the main entrance leading directly to his palace. Meanwhile, the other entrance, situated on the far side of the city, was protected by both a swamp and a strong timber palisade. Storming Syracana would be far from easy. Nevertheless, Satyrus remained undeterred and determined to eradicate this threat to his rule. After plundering the neighbouring land, he besieged the city. Initially, the siege brought mixed success. The Bosporan king's attempt to break through the main entrance and strike directly at Arifanes' palace was thwarted, the wooden towers and the outworks proving a death trap for Satyrus' men. Still, all was not doom and gloom for Satyrus. As the first attack was going in, the king had ordered another portion of his army to attack the entrance through the swamp. Getting through the marsh was no doubt difficult for these men, and they then had the equally difficult job of destroying the palisade and breaching the city. It was a big ask. The result, however, was an overwhelming success. Satyrus's men forced their way through the swamp, catching Arifanes' defence completely off guard. Swiftly they captured the palisade, swiftly they destroyed it. The city was breached. Having destroyed the barricades and crossed his army to that side of the river, Satyrus now set his eyes on Eumelos and Arifanes, shirking behind their walled-off stronghold on the far side of the island. Victory seemed near. Arifanes' citadel would not be easy to breach, however. Standing in the army's way was a dense forest that had to be removed if they were to advance. Satyrus was not going to turn around now, and so he set to work. He ordered his soldiers to cut down the woods and create a roadway through the forest to the citadel's walls. But Arifanes would not sit idly by as his enemies slowly carved their way towards him. He stationed archers on both sides of the passage by whose aid he easily inflicted mortal wounds on the men who were cutting down the woods. For because of the density of the trees, they could neither see the missiles in time, nor strike back at the archers. Although the woodcutters and roadlayers suffered heavily from Arifanes' archers, the work continued. Within four days, their roadway had traversed the passage and drawn near the wall. Now, they had to breach it. Satyrus's army advanced, pushing laboriously forwards through the confined roadway, a valley of death, as Arifanes and Eumelos' soldiers rained a hail of arrows down upon them. Right and left, men fell as they tried to advance. Fighting a cornered foe, they must have known the battle was going to be hard fought. The worst was still to come. As Satyrus's men reached the wall, Eumelos and Arifanes sallied out from the defences with a large force to oppose them. With spear, sword, axe and shield, 
the desperate defenders defiantly fought back. Overwhelmed, Satyrus's men began to waver. Seeing his men were struggling against the great tide of cornered defenders, Satyrus rushed to their aid, perhaps believing that another personally led charge would clinch success. Yet this time, there would be no repeat of his previous heroics. According to a local legend, prior to the siege, Satyrus received a prophecy. They say that the god had told Satyrus to be on his guard against the mouse, lest it sometime cause his death. Because of this, Satyrus had always feared mice, believing they would be the architects of his downfall. Yet despite his bizarre phobia, the prophecy now came to fruition, albeit from an unexpected direction. As Satyrus and his men forced back the sally, a defender's spear tore through the Bosporan king's upper arm muscle, known also in Greek as the mouse. Unable to fight on, Satyrus withdrew from the assault. His men followed close behind. Eumelos and Ariphanes had held on, and for them, further good news soon followed. That night at Satyrus's camp, the prophecy was fulfilled. Mortally wounded by the blow he had received just hours earlier, the Bosporan king breathed his last. The victor of the clash at the Thatis River and the rightful Bosporan ruler was no more. He had reigned only nine months. As Satyrus's reign ended abruptly, so too did the siege of Syracana. What remained of Satyrus's demoralized army retreated to the eastern coast of Lake Myotis, bearing their dead leader's body. From there, they had Satyrus's corpse sent to Panticopium, where his brother, Pritanis, received it and provided a burial fit for a king. The reign of Satyrus was over. The rule of Pritanis had begun. Pritanis now continued the war his brothers had started, crossing the Bosporus, taking command of Satyrus's army, and refusing to co-rule the kingdom with his resurgent younger brother. There would be no peace. Realising any attempts to negotiate were fruitless, Eumelos acted. Having learnt that Pritanis had quickly retreated his main army back to Panticopium, Eumelos and Ariphanes made their move. Overwhelming Pritanis' small garrison at a place called Gargaza, perhaps Gerusa or Gorgippa, and capturing the coastal city. It was a warning of things to come. Slowly, Eumelos turned the screw on Pritanis' army, defeating his elder brother in battle and forcing him to flee to the shores of Lake Myotis. Realising there was no escape, Pritanis swallowed his pride and submitted to his younger brother handing over his kingship and the army. Eumelos was now king. Yet this was not the end of the fratricidal civil war. There was still one more twist in the story. The fragile peace between Eumelos and Pritanis did not last long. Soon after, Pritanis cast his die one last time in an all-or-nothing move. Having entered Panticopium, Pyrrhusades' middle son proclaimed that he was Satyrus's rightful heir, hoping to somehow topple his younger brother. Unable to gather enough support, Pritanis' campaign evaporated. He and whatever supporters he had were overpowered, and the claimant fled across the Cimmerian Strait to Kepi, known as the Gardens. There would be no escape for Pritanis this time, however. Upon reaching the Gardens, Pritanis was slain. Two of the brothers now lay dead. Thus ended the Bosporan Civil War. Through blood and iron, Eumelos had waged a ruthless and risky war for control of the lucrative kingdom. Still, the gamble had paid off, at the expense of his brothers' lives. Yet for Eumelos, it was worth it. As soon as he heard that Britannus' body ran cold, Eumelos set about securing his hard-won rule. He had all but one of his dead brothers' family and friends swiftly put to the sword. 
while Eumelos quelled any unrest by greatly lightening taxes. With such brutality and benefaction, Eumelos secured his spear one rule. For the next five years, Eumelos set about increasing Bosporan might further. Not only did his powerful navy rid the Black Sea of menacing pirates, a Bosporan merchant's greatest fear, but he also followed in his forefathers' footsteps and embarked on ambitious military campaigns. Taking advantage of the experience he had gained fighting his brothers, Eumelos conquered neighbouring Scythian lands through blood and battle. His ambitious aim to become the leading power along the Black Sea was slowly taking shape. Eumelos's successes proved he was every bit his father's son. As for Arifanes, following the civil war nothing survives on what happened to him. Most likely, Eumelos rewarded him and his Syracuse with more land in Bosporan territory, perhaps at the expense of their rival Scythians. Yet this is merely a theory, and the answer remains shrouded in mystery and lost, at least for now, in history. As Eumelos's power increased, so too did his fame. Tales of his leadership, nobility and benefaction to merchants in the Black Sea spread far and wide. Byzantium, Sinope and Calantia, all powerful Greek cities that became indebted to the Bosporan king. Within a short time, Eumelos had become the guardian angel of the Black Sea communities and the ruler of a kingdom that could rival even Lysimachus, the powerful successor king ruling in Thrace. By 304 BC, Eumelos' struggles during the civil war must have seemed a distant memory. Yet just as Eumelos' power was enjoying a seemingly unstoppable rise, death came knocking, albeit in rather bizarre circumstances. Just as his elder brother Satyrus had a prophetic end, so too did Eumelos. The warning was that he should be on guard against the house that is on the move. Therefore, he never afterward entered a house freely unless his servants had previously examined the roof and the foundations. Despite Eumelos' best efforts, the prophecy rang true. On his way to conduct a sacrifice, the horses pulling Eumelos' carriage were startled and became uncontrollable. Fearing for his life, the Bosporan king jumped from his palace on wheels, hoping to escape. It was not to be. As Eumelos jumped, his sword caught in the wheel, and he was dragged along by the motion of the carriage and died on the spot. Thus ended the reign of Eumelos, a reign that would mark the high tide of Bosporan might. Following his passing, a slow and steady decline for the kingdom soon followed. To the north, east and west, the threat from bloodthirsty barbarians once again reared its ugly head. Meanwhile, to the south, a very different threat began to emerge. Grain exports had always been the keystone to the Bosporan Kingdom's great wealth. Yet after 300 BC, Bosporan hegemony over this commodity came under threat. Following the bloody wars of Alexander the Great's successors, a new trade rival had emerged in the form of the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt. Having the bountiful Nile River flowing right through its heart, the Ptolemies could boast some of the most fertile lands in the known world. They were sure to take advantage. As Ptolemaic grain found willing buyers across the Mediterranean, particularly in Athens and later Rome, the Bosporan Kingdom's monopoly came crashing down. Egypt was now the breadbasket of the Eastern Mediterranean. For centuries, the Bosporan Kingdom had thrived, being just out of reach of some of history's great superpowers including both the Persians and Alexander the Great. Still, it could not last forever, and in 109 BC, this Greco-Scythian kingdom on the northern edge of the known world bid farewell to its independence when it came under the rule of another ambitious monarch, one eager to himself become the dominant power in the Black Sea region, Mithridates. Although the kingdom continued to exist down into the Roman period, never again would it enjoy the golden age of power and prosperity it had achieved during the 4th century BC. 
and never again would it endure a civil war as fascinating as the one between Satyrus, Pritanis, and Eumelos. <laughs>